Good morning. So we're going to switch gears quite a bit. <laughs> this is exciting. Woo! <laughs> Patterson. I'm a sexual health promoter with Toronto Public Health. And um, Dan and I are going to put that together. I'm going to do some of the more introductory stuff work uh, first. So my entry into this work is um, doing disability advocacy from when I was a teenager. I, um, so I have a bit of a unique perspective as a sexual health promoter. We have a very um, interdisciplinary team. And so some of my colleagues are nurses. Um, so not all sexual health promoters are nurses. Um, and so I come from a critical disability perspective. So I have a developmental services worker diploma from Centennial. And then I did critical disability studies at Ryerson and New York. And working in the field uh, many years ago, I was very troubled by the absence of discussions about sexuality and the absences of sex education and supports to have sexual and intimate relationships. So those early experiences really moved me to do more of my work around sex and disability advocacy. So I'm gonna go through some slides and then we'll have some time for discussion. Um, please interrupt me if you need to clarify something. If I use an acronym, it's, my acronyms won't be on here sheet. So please, if you need something for clarification, we can publish the words. So, so some of the content that I'll be talking about will be new for some of you. And for some of you, it will be a review. So I really want to honor the expectations of the room. We're all coming from very different perspectives, different comfort levels around sexuality, different, very different lenses. And so I invite us all to, to share those perspectives um, when we have the, our conversations. So I'm really laying the groundwork for some of those ideas, um, how it will inform their practice. And so Deanna will talk us through more activities and teaching tips. So I'm going to talk about the Toronto Public Health Sexual Health Philosophy and kind of Principles. I'm going to talk about what is sexuality? What do we mean by uh, sexual health education? why we do uh, sexuality education and sexual health promotion, the barriers to sexuality uh, education for people with disabilities. I'll talk about my role as a sexual health promoter <coughs> and some of the resources that we have on our team, and we'll talk about the case study. So, Toronto Public Health has this sexual health philosophy and guiding principles to policy that everyone in Toronto Public Health is uh, mandated to work from. So regardless if someone is a dietitian or if they are a um, healthy families uh, support person, they need to be working from this policy. So we believe that over the lifespan, sexuality may include the basic needs for touch, intimacy and connection, emotional expression, love and pleasure. We promote a satisfying, safe and pleasurable sexual life while reducing harm, judgment, shame, guilt, coercion, and abuse. And choice to participate in consensual sexual activity and support de decisions about whether, how, and when to have children. So, as sexual health promoters, we are sex positive, we're inclusive of all, uh, all gender identities and sexual orientations, <laughs> client-centered, inclusive, non-judgmental, respectful, pro-choice, evidence-informed, and we um, work from and we practice harm reduction. And again, I'm saying this is sexual health promotion, but it is something that everyone in Toronto Public Health works from. So I just want to take a moment to talk about what do we mean by uh, sexuality? Because there's a lot of misconceptions, panic, and fear about what we mean by sexuality and what we mean by sex education. So uh, we know that there's many ways to be sexual, and there's many ways to have sex. So sex goes beyond physical <coughs> actions. There's many ways to have sex. Um, it's part of every life stage. It's a big part of ourselves from the day we're born to the day we die. It's 
because it's our sense of our bodies, how we live in our bodies, how we experience our, our bodies. Uh, pleasure and intimacy, relationships of all different kinds, uh, reproduction, so making those choices about if or how we reproduce, or um, parenting options, our gender identity, and our sexual identity. So the question of why sex education? Why do people with disabilities need sex education? Well, our work is as sexual health promoters is to make sure that everyone has access to good quality sex education. And so when we're just thinking about it from a disability perspective, there are some particular issues to um, be mindful of. So we know that, this is not news to anyone in the room here, that sexual abuse rates for people with developmental disabilities is typically much higher. So I'll just give you, a, uh, there's a few stats here. So 83% of women with disabilities will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. Only 3% of sexual abuse cases involving people with developmental disabilities are ever reported. We know that there are many barriers to reporting sexual abuse and sexual assault. Um, and of course, there would be many more barriers for people with disabilities to report because of um, if it's being, if it's a situation that's involving a care dynamic, people have a risk of losing their, their care, their housing. So there's all those many more complex barriers. And children with intellectual impairments appear to be the most vulnerable, with 4.6 times the risk of sexual violence than the non-disabled peers. So those are some pretty high numbers, and numbers that we need to pay attention to. So I. I want to also give a caveat to this, the information about abuse and um, abuse prevention. So of course we know that abuse prevention and violence prevention is a really Im important uh, work to be done. However, that we see that sometimes the risk of abuse or the possibility of is abuse uh, is a reason to justify not letting people be sexual, right? So that fear of people be, being a sexual person can create a lot of anxiety or discomfort. <coughs> and so in families and in service providers, there can be that, um, <coughs> that um, pressure to, to care for people in ways that means preventing them from being harmed or hurt. So I'll talk more a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Um, so I just want to be really clear that you know, there are these stats and we want to be thinking about abuse prevention, but at the same time, sex education is so much more than abuse prevention. Everyone needs to learn about their bodies, how their bodies work, about desire, about pleasure, and so much more. So we hear, I've heard this quite many times, um, and those of us who are doing sex and disability work, we hear from people in the disability community and from service providers, but sexuality isn't important. We have so many other better things to be worrying about. We have to worry about housing. We have to worry about employment. We have to worry about long-term planning. And absolutely, those are, you know, there's a whole range of issues that we need to be supporting people on. But at the same time, we need to be making sure that sexuality um, is seen as an important disability issue. So even though we have those fears about sexuality and there's that pressure to wanting to protect and to prevent harm in people's lives, then we want to make sure that that's not a reason to exclude people from getting information and from being able to be seen as a sexual person. So we know that regardless of our bodies, regardless of our identities, that most people have intersexual interest and curiosity. And for even people who identify as asexual, still have a need for some kind of intimacy. We just all express it in very different ways. So it looks different for sexuality, looks different for <coughs> lifespan, and the way that we support people will look really different, and to make sure that people get to be their, their whole selves. There's many, many different barriers to um, sex education or sexual health support for people with disabilities. So a lot of them, uh, I would argue, is that they are sexual 
we created. So this is a problem of people's bodies or people's ability to understand. Um, as educators, as service providers, we have an obligation to make our information accessible to people so that they understand um, what we're, how we're supporting them and the information that is not meaningful and relevant to them. There's lots of different stereotypes, very harmful stereotypes about people with disabilities and um, who they are as sexual beings, you know, being seen as asexual or undesirable, right? So that idea that like people um, are desired, but disabilities aren't desirable. We live in a world where we see lots of many images of people without disabilities all the time who are sexual. We very rarely see images of disabled people in the dominant media that are sexy and that are beautiful. Um, people are stereotyped as being incompetent. So no, no, that person, they, they can't understand. They're not able to handle you know, these serious issues around sexuality. Or on the other end of the, the spectrum, people are being seen as hypersexual or deviant, right? So they are overly sexual and that we need to control to prevent those behaviors, right? And sometimes people's sexual desires are seen through a behavior lens, something to be modified or to be fixed. So we also see that when we do address sexuality and disability issues, a lot of the materials tend to be very heterosexual focused. So if we're acknowledging that people are, are sexual, we need to make sure that we're being inclusive, with not just um, people who are heterosexual and interested in opposite sex or opposite gender relationships, that we're being inclusive of people who are identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, or queer. So we'll talk a little bit more about that piece then. So ableism. So that um, discrimination against people with disabilities. Some one of the common uh, thing that we hear about is that people assumed I would never have sex. So in terms of the stats of STIs and HIV, we don't collect numbers around people with disabilities. And so when people go to get tested and they test positive for an STI or HIV, we don't ask if they identify as a person with a disability or not. Uh, that being said, we know anecdotally there is lots of literature out there that um, and first-person accounts of people who say that um, they were never given any sex education, they were told explicitly, people just thought I would never have sex, I wouldn't be sexual, and so they didn't get information about STIs, they didn't get information about safer sex, and now they have an STI or they're now HIV positive. So again, another barrier, um, we live in a world that really values um, able-bodiedness, we really value not disabled people. And so it's a big, um, it's harmful when you see other people in the world being represented and you don't see yourself as being a sexual person. So, like I said a, a moment ago, um, that lack of information really puts people at risk. Right? So we are doing the harm, we are harming people when we don't give them information when they don't have access to accessible information about sexuality because we are putting them at risk um, for things like STIs and HIV um, <coughs> violence, right? If you don't have the supports to learn about relationships, um, you might find yourself in a place where you're being abused and you might not even understand that it's abuse. And I know that there's been lots of great work done in the sector around um, that being said, we want to make sure that we're moving beyond um, abuse, right? So we're thinking about um, sex as something that's positive, something that's really an important part of our of everyone's lives. So there's been lots of really wonderful work done by many um, people with disabilities who are activists in the disability community. There's a whole growing body of literature in the field of sexuality and disability studies. And so the, there's many different sort of phases of how we've talked about sex and disability. And so this 
literature is basically saying that sexual sexuality is a is a disability issue. So sexual rights is a, is a really important disability issue, and it really is about many of the core issues that we are already as disability service providers and um, activists working on. Right. So we want to support people to be autonomous, to have real meaningful choices in their lives, to have relationships. But all different kinds of relationships, not just you know relationships with community members, but intimate and sexual relationships. And to support people to move beyond um, just looking at abuse prevention, but also to move beyond masturbation. And so uh, there's um, a scholar, <coughs> excuse me, Mike Gill, who's done some work around masturbation training and how um, sometimes when we do support people to be sexual, that we just leave it at masturbation or self pleasuring And that's a form of harm because we know that people want need to be supported to learn about having sex with other people, not just having sex with themselves. And sex education is also a, like, like a thing, it's a disability issue to have pleasure in your life and parenting, right? So to help support people to think about their dreams to become a parent. We know that the legacy of eugenics and in Canada really has continued on in that people with disabilities are given the messages that they shouldn't be parents, that they can't be parents. And so there's some big issues there too. So my job as a sexual health promoter is to help disrupt all this, which is really exciting. <laughs> so my role is um, we do a bunch of different workshops. So we have, um, and there's a flyer that you'll be able to take with you if you like, of training trainer workshops that my team offers that are free, free full day trainings on different sexual health topics and harm reduction. And so as service providers, you can go to these and you can spend some time to feel more confident and to have more capacity um, to talk about sexual health and harm reduction. Uh, sexual health promoters, we also, all of us have, we do a portfolio of workshops. And so my, <clears throat> excuse me, as a sexual health promoter, I go out to community groups all over the city and we do workshops on relationships, safer sex, birth control, um, STIs, and we can really tailor it to your group. And that can look really different depending on your client needs or your agency needs. Um, you know, I realize that all of you are working with adults, but just so you know, another piece of our work in sexual um, health promotion is to support the teachers to implement the, um, the health component of the Ontario curriculum. So you might have heard in the media that there's been some changes recently to the curriculum. <coughs> and so our job is to go out and support teachers to implement that part of the curriculum. And <coughs> of course, Students with disabilities in special education and self-contained classrooms should be getting that information, uh, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. It really depends on the teacher and how that, um, how that looks depending on the, the school. So we're ha supporting teachers to be more confident to be able to implement the material for students with disabilities as well. And we also have a large database of resources and so you'll be able to grab some on your way out. So different pamphlets on various sexual health topics. We have one series of pamphlets that is disability specific. So for people, people with developmental disabilities, we have um, three pamphlets in this Let's Talk series. And it's um, one of them, for example, is a task analysis of how to put on a condom and it's a visual tool. And there's two other pamphlets about safer sex and so when we have a bunch of other um, pamphlets that aren't as plain language, but they're available. And we also have a condom distribution program. So we give out condoms to individuals and to service providers that, that need them for their people that they're supporting. <coughs> so let's just start thinking about practice. So how do we make the shift towards including disability and sexuality issues in your book? So there's lots of different materials out there. There's lots of tons of information about lesson plans, about 
sexual health education, all sorts of fun activities and games. We're going to go through some of those today. But I just want to say that if you don't necessarily need a disability specific resource, that you can adapt your materials for your audience, right? So meeting people where they're at and making your materials more accessible so that they meet the needs of the people you're supporting. So I hear this all the time, oh no, we have to get the sexual health educator in, they're the expert. Well, anyone can be a so-called expert in sexuality and there's lots of different ways to give different messages to people to support their sexual selves in different ways. And of course, it's going to look really different for an employment coach versus, say, someone in housing. There's all different ways you can start to begin to support people. I just want to reinforce that in this work, it's really important to think moving beyond a few, okay? So, and moving beyond the basics. We see in our sexual health workshops all the time, working with adults labeled with developmental disabilities, that because of that neglect, because of those lack of opportunities that they have had to learn about their sexual selves, their sexual body parts, that they're oftentimes, if they know the names of their body parts, their sexual body parts, if they know about uh, the different names, let's, that's, Good. That's it, you know, that's seen as good. That's the basic. But again, when we just see that as doing good enough by just helping people learn just about their body parts, that we're not making sure that people have the range of information that they do need to have. And to also go beyond saying no, right? So when we just, again, focus on abuse and abuse prevention and to help people learn how to say no, people also need to learn how to say yes. So what would it feel like to say yes? to um, a sexual opportunity? What would it mean to say yes to, to go out with someone in, on a date? So not just those opportunities to say no and to protect themselves, but to also help people to take risks and to take safer risks, informed risks. And of course, being LGBTQ inclusive. And of course, everyone has a really important role in this Right? So we need to use a team approach that service providers and families, everyone has a really important role to play. And of course that role will look really different. And we also know that repetition, a lot of people, people with disabilities learn really well through repetition. And so we, of course we all need to be on board, making sure that people get a variety of information So, we will show, so some of the, the teaching tools, like they're called the Swedish cards, you'll see them. So there's lots of visual tools that are out there, visual picture images that can be used as great conversation starters, right, so that your material isn't just written and it's not accessible so that there's more opportunities for people to learn from stories or to learn from pictures. There's the sex esteem curriculum which um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more as well and there's lots of supports available right? so if you feel like you go back to your agency and you start to have these conversations and you think wow like I'd really like to have someone in to Support us to have more conversations about how we can be more sex positive. Like I've said, I try to public health myself as a sexual health promoter. I can come in and support you. Um, the GSP relationship worker will be doing a presentation on, on different kinds of presentations about relationships as well. Lots of lots of resources and supports out there. So why don't we? Pause. I've just talked at you quite a lot, so why don't we pause for questions and then we'll briefly talk about the, the case study. So my information is up here on the screen and there's some of my cards on the table outside with the resources. There's also the number for Tribal Public Health, our intake number. You can call and speak to an intake worker about all sorts of different services that Tribal Public Health offers and other other. Lots of different supports and resources available around nutrition, 
run a disease injury prevention, so take advantage of that too. Um, I have just a couple of web resources to share. Those are also in your packages. So you can visit the Toronto Public Health website. There's a sexual health page, and there's some resources there, including lesson plans that are for teachers, but they have great teaching tips and content to help you move along in your own journey of learning so you can pass it on to people you support. The Internet Citizenship Group is a group of self-advocates and service providers and activists and scholarly people who got together in Toronto last year to do some work around sex and disability. So you can check out their blog. They have some really interesting resources. Rainbow Health Ontario is an LGBTQ-specific resource. Scarlet Teen is a website uh, mostly geared towards teens, but there's a ton of information that's really well done around sexuality. It's not a plain language resource at all. It's very uh, dense, but there's some really good information there that I would highly recommend. And Sexuality U, which also has some disability specific information. So just to quickly uh, talk about the case study. So Sam, so here are just quickly some of my thoughts. Because what we want to do is um, give you more time to do some discussions and activities around sexuality. So some of just some quick thoughts that I came up with around Sam is of course, what does Sam want and what is important to her? The worst, I, when I read the case study, I assumed that Sam uses the pronoun she or her. We also have to make sure that for anyone, we always want to check in around people's self-identification. So in the case study, it says that Sam identifies as a lesbian. So we want to ask, you know, what name do you use? What pronouns do you use? That's making sure that we're respecting people's gender identity. So it's just some things to think about. Of course, changes in routine. It can be stressful for a lot of people. At first, there was, before we had revised the case study, there was some um, reference to Sam feeling anxious. And so, rather than pathologizing um, <coughs> the feelings of change, to just normalize that everyone feels, you know, so called anxious, right? It's nerve wracking for people to have change. And then when people, who, people with disabilities and people who identify as LGBTQ, meeting new people can be especially difficult, nerve-wracking, right? So how are people going to judge me? Am I going to encounter homophobia? Am I going to encounter ableism? Which is things people are already thinking about. So how to support Sam around potentially some issues around homophobia and ableism? Um, thinking about agency barriers, right? So someone brought up a great example earlier about when people don't have opportunities for private time and private spaces, that those agency barriers really um, constrict the kind of relationships and connections that people can make. So Sam is currently living alone, but uh, while um, the, until Sam can live with her partner, is there a, how to make sure that you're fostering that relationship? Like what does Sam need and to support that relationship? Maybe there's something that Sam's partner needs. And then moving just away from the individual level, also thinking about agency level. So what does the agency need? So a training on sexuality, a training on relationships, maybe some information about LGBTQ issues. And so I would just point out that there's lots of different resources in Toronto to support that work. So the 519 Church Community Center does some trainings around LGBTQ identities for service providers. Rainbow Health Ontario, like I said, uh, on the last slide, has a ton of resources on their website, but they also go out and do trainings for service providers. And the Relationship Work Group through the DSTO that we're going to be eventually doing some presentations in a little traveling roadshow. Do you want to, do you want to add? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll leave it there. And now we're going to get on to the fun, moving into practice. How do we implement this? 
So on the sheets that you guys have, it says, Deanna Jost, the STO facilitator, Developmental Services Toronto. I just want to point out this presentation. I'm taking off my DSTO facilitator hat, and I'm putting on a different hat right now. And you can think of it as a community hat, advocacy hat, whatever you want, but I'm going to DSTO facilitator what I'm talking to you today, okay? Um, so resources and teaching tools that Jen talked about was uh, no need to be an expert. I'm not an expert. Um, don't need disability-specific resources, adapt to your audience. I do that. Um, I had the good fortune of growing up uh, with a family member who had developed a disability who was close to my age. And we had very different experiences in life. And uh, when it came to relationships, it was also the case. And I was always really curious about that because I didn't think it was fair. He would get away with way more stuff than I could get away with. <laughs> and um, so growing up, I had this always in front of me. So it was a this is a conversation I'm completely comfortable with. Uh, I like to be disruptive, and I like to have conversations that other people uh, maybe shy away from, but I also think um, relationships are valuable, and it's what makes us uh, survive in life at the end of the day. And um, I've, I use the Swedish cards in this presentation, and I am Swedish, so that seems appropriate, right? <laughs> um, and the relationship work group, the DSTO relationship work group. I'm one of the founding members of the, uh, the DSTO um, relationship work group that's affiliated with the DSTO Council, supported by the DSTO Council. Um, and it's a fantastic group of self-advocates, agency member, community members, and we talk about relationships. We brought the sex esteem train, the trainer, to Toronto. And we had a great turnout by a lot of agencies, and we're hoping to bring back another series of those sex esteem. We're also looking at going into schools and talking about transition relationships in schools with, with Jen's support. So we've done a lot of good work. So if you're interested in the DSTO relationship work group, please come and talk to me. Um, we're always looking for more folks to support and help us out. So I've been teaching this concept of this work, this workshop for about a decade. I've adapted it to different groups, obviously. I've taught um, very small groups to very large groups. I was just at the uh, Tourette's conference in Niagara Falls to youth. Um, and everyone gives, it provides me with a different experience. So when you go on to a group, you've got to be able to adapt to the, differ the differences and um, be able to reach out. So this presentation is actually a presentation that I would present to anyone um, that I support. So this is going to be the real deal, except it's obviously more condensed. Um, I've also been done some of this work in the school system with uh, some teachers, which was really interesting. So talking about adjusting, uh, on, like from, from the first time you go in to the next week, completely throwing out your agenda and re redoing it because uh, you have to be able to reach out to those, those folks who understand it. So the first thing we need to talk about is we do sort of uh, rules, you can do ground rules, but just talk about when you talk about um, relationships with a group is everyone has the right to sexual education. Our space is always positive and welcoming, and all questions are great questions. And what we, what I would usually do with groups of folks is they come up with their own ground rules, and it's it's um, always live. So if someone does something constantly that's irritating the rest of the group, and it's really distracting. We talk about that as being a new rule on the wall, so that people aren't taken away from the experience or distracted from the experience. And sometimes when people are uncomfortable about topics, behaviors occur, right? So we want to address that to want people to be comfortable. So I don't know if you guys noticed this picture here, sort of the heteronormative, the plug-in. <coughs> okay. okay, so let's talk about um, your support circle, people we support, yourself. You can't have relationships unless you look at yourself. And this can work for everyone in the room. So this might be a I might do a little counseling session with all of you who reflecting about yourself other than the people we support, right? But this is about ourselves. And um, how often do we have conversations with the people we support and ask them, how are you, how are you feeling? What's going on, right? We, we deal with the medical, we deal with behaviors, we do all sorts of stuff. But do we ever say good morning, how are you doing today? How are you feeling, right? Um, and just having that, that really casual interaction. 
So when I do this workshop, I work from the in out, so self, partner, family, friends, community helpers, and strangers. Some people have seen this before, it's, just, it's circles and there's colors in it. Yeah, boundaries? Yeah. Okay, so I've just, I adapted a little bit differently for the groups, but um, what's an example of a community helper, just to make sure you folks know what I'm talking about? What's a community helper? Hospital, yeah. 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 Hospital doctor, nurse, anyone else? Support staff. Support staff? Policeman? Yeah, someone in uniform, typically someone in uniform is um, deemed as someone's safe, uh, a community helper, okay? Just so that we're clear when we talk about this language. Family friend, intimacy partner, um, and I don't want to assume in intimacy, so it's partner, and then that big old heart, which is love yourself. So how do we get people to be reflective? Okay, in yourself. Tips that I explore with the folks uh, I, I do in a workshop is, we talk about the difference between values and beliefs. Do you know what the difference is between values and beliefs? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, I'll give you the answer. <laughs> um, value is tagged in, in Wikipedia, or uh, in the book, it says the regard that something is held, the importance or worth, the person's principle or standards of behavior, one's judgment or rules. So when we talk about values, everyone comes with a set of values. What often we don't have is conversations about where those values came from. Uh, and it may not be theirs. It may be from a family member or a caregiver. They may not agree with it. So it's, it's worth having that conversation. And the same is, what do they believe? Um, what do they accept as a statement is true? They don't often believe, but they're told it's true, and so they do it. So you have to kind of dissect a little bit about the difference between values and beliefs and find out at the core what, what, how people feel about their own values and beliefs and learn about them as individuals. Um, this is a really interesting one. What are goals and what are dreams? There's a real difference here. But often, with the folks we support, um, they're the same, and they shouldn't be. So a good example of a goal is specific, and measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-sensitive, right? So we talk about what's called a SMART goal. So a good example is someone says to me, I want to get my driver's license. I say, great, so how do we get our driver's license? And you literally go through this exercise from A, from S all the way down to how long this is going to take you. That is a goal. A dream is winning the lottery. Okay? Or getting married to Michael Bolton, which was one of someone's dr uh, dreams, right? Or goals, but we, we discussed it. It's, it's definitely a dream. Um, but for them to understand that there's a difference. So when someone says, says, says to me, I want to get married, great. So how do you get married? Let's go through the specific thing as, as if it was a goal. Because this shouldn't be a dream. This should be a goal. Right? So we talk about the difference and we have those, those conversations so that we can make our conversations more accessible and more meaningful. Um, in the same way as, what does love mean? What does love mean? Everyone interprets it differently. It's a really interesting question to ask someone with development disability. Um, because uh, love shouldn't be just assumed. They should have a certain feeling. And so you have to talk about those feelings, what love is, what it feels like inside, and, and sort of be able to have folks describe it, okay? Um, and sometimes to get down to the to get down to the nitty gritty of what love is, if you show pictures of like really hot celebrities that they love. I don't know, what's the latest movies out? Uh, what was the movie that was out? Uh, <coughs> so name some shows of really hot celebrities that are on the list right now. Hmm? Uh -huh. Who gets your heart pumping, people? <laughs> he doesn't get my heart pumping, but uh, Brian Reynolds is a lot of people like okay. him. Okay, so <laughs> if you say his name, do you get a little queasy? Do you get a little weak? You know, we've got to come up with people or names, or maybe someone they know that gets them going. So we've got to talk about love. That's not love. Is that love? Yeah. Do we even know that person? So what I often do is I show a lot of pictures of celebrities, and I see, get people's juices flowing a little bit and see how they're feeling and I say, guess what? This is not love. This is a crush. Because you don't know them. They're in your stranger circle. <laughs> right? We may know a lot about them, but they don't know a lot about us. 
So sometimes it's really important to make that distinction, okay? Make that clear. What does love mean? And it's different. You should love your mom or your dad or your brother different than Ryan, Ryan, Ryan Reynolds, okay? Um, and so it's, it's really important to have that conversation. Don't assume that they understand or that they know. Um, and it's a great exercise to talk about that. Um, what is self-esteem? Do we have it? We must a little bit, right? If we don't, is it obvious? So self-esteem is confidence in one's own worth or abilities. Do you think that the people we support have high self-esteem? Probably not. So what you have to do is, is that this is an exercise to pump people up. Let's talk about what you're good at. Let's talk about what you love to do. I had a gentleman who was like incredible at the TTC. He knew every single stop, what bus was where. His talent was amazing. And so we talked about that. Because he said he has no skills. I, yeah, you do. But sometimes you have to bring it out and you have to discuss it with them and, and bring it to light, okay? So you have to pump the room up. You have to pump yourself up around self-esteem. And then what do you, uh, how do you learn to feel better about yourself? So that self-esteem turns into self-respect. And that's sort of how we have to flow into our conversation around relationships. You can't have relationships if you don't have good self-esteem or even know what your values and your beliefs are, what makes your heart race, what doesn't make your heart race. Find yourself confidence, take responsibility, be positive, imagine your message. Improve your messages, right? All that energy is helpful. One of the games that I always play is um, when someone comes in to my workshop, they have to say something positive, a compliment every single day, right? Because often we come in, oh, the traffic, the weather, the, the Trump, like whatever you want to talk about, right? My, my, my. So I ask them to come in and think about something positive. It's amazing how that changes the room. Right? And all of a sudden, people are making compliments to other people and it becomes a habit. Right? And that's really helpful because that might be the only compliment they've heard for a week, a month, a day. It's wonderful. And it's great for the person who facilitates as well. Okay? Okay, so part of self esteem and self respect is etiquette, it's good manners. I don't think when you sit on the subway you feel like people have good etiquette obviously, right? So one of the things that boosts people's self-esteem is good manners, polite behavior, which should be an expectation of everyone. And often isn't an expectation of the people we support. It's like the last thing sometimes on our list of things that we'll, we'll do, right? And that was what my cousin got away with. He was a rude little man. And I'd be like, why can't he get away with this? Why he's this? I don't care. He was rude and I can't be rude. That's not fair. And so when you're young, you're trying to navigate that. And even to this day, we have this conversation um, about manners and being polite. Because, um, again, it should be a social skill that we all should know and, and, and do. So if uh, it refers to the guidelines that control the way uh, and how an individual should behave in society. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we all had manners? If anyone's phone goes off, you're going down. <laughs> okay? So, in order for people to understand what I'm talking about, I like to do an exercise <coughs> with you today. Um, but before I do that, I want to talk about some of the etiquettes or manners that I go through with the folks I support. And I use a lot of visuals. Uh, it's important because, you know what, if you're learning this stuff, you've got to look at something fun. Um, and I go through it. And actually, just this page could probably take me a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Social etiquette teaches someone how to behave in society. So we talk about things in, in, a, in, a social, in a social context around all the things that they would like to learn and talk about. What are some social etiquettes? Saying excuse me. That's great, isn't it? Yeah. That's really basic, but that's where we start, right? not talking over someone, not interrupting someone, all those sort of things that sometimes we do that are not. Corporate etiquette refers to how an individual behaves in a workplace. So what I have to do is I set up a, a lot of times the folks that support say my parents are working, they go to meetings, they do these things. Um, so sometimes what I do is I plan a meeting, like a, like a formal meeting with the group, and I show them how you operate and run a proper meeting. And we do the corporate etiquette piece. 
people love it because they have now identified something that their parent does on a regular basis and able to come home and have a conversation about, I learned how to operate a meeting. Do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? And they have the, the information. It's fantastic. Bathroom etiquette. Oh, this is a fun one. <laughs> what do you think goes on in the bathroom? So this particular bathroom etiquette, I have um, a beauty kit that I uh, carry around with me for the ladies. Um, and I talk about the use of feminine napkins, pads, tampons. I actually bring them out and I put a bunch of tampons in water and I'll show the gentlemen what tampons are, what pads are, and the etiquette of that. Nine times out of 10, guys don't even know what a tampon is. They saw it once in their mother's purse or their sister's purse. They have no clue what it is. But I tell you, when they see that thing expand in water, and you tell them where that goes and why, they're like, okay. <laughs> Just give them the opportunity to learn. It's really important. This is our life as women. You should understand, gents, what this is all about, okay? If you need access to tampons beyond condoms, you come and talk to me. I'll give you some tampons, and I can show you what happens here, and you need to educate yourself on it, okay? Um, and the same with pads, too, and how to put them away properly. The same with gentlemen around the bathroom and what they see and what's, you know, peeing in the seat, all sorts of stuff. It gets brought up. Bathroom etiquette is public and private, okay? Talk about all of this. Wedding etiquette, this is the funnest conversation because you always hear about people's drunk relatives and all the shenanigans that goes on at weddings. And um, they just let it rip and they know. They know. So. Um, we talk about wedding etiquette, when is the wedding coming up, or how to behave. Um, that's obviously, the rules are always broken in usually weddings. Meeting etiquette, so we introduce the meeting piece to the corporate. I usually incorporate the both eating. Oh, tell me, tell me, tell me about eating. We do this at lunch. So if there are things that are happening at lunch, we try to set up something more formal, and we eat and we talk about etiquettes at lunch in the practice of it, okay? Eating, also what I do is I talk about different types of eating in terms of formal, semi-formal, um, and then we sort of set the table up and we learn how to set the table properly. Um, I'll bring in some plates and stuff like that so we can learn about table manners while we eat lunch at the same time. Um, and this ties into something else to be talking about further. Telephone etiquette, the cell phone. I can't even tell you how painful the telephone etiquette has become. And I'm sure for a lot of you, and a lot of people talk about their workers. Yeah, how they interrupt them, or the phone always goes off, or it's a distraction, or they're always texting when they're supposed to be helping and taking care of them. The social rules for telephone etiquette has been thrown out the door. And I think we should all step back and remind ourselves about our behavior on, t on a cell phone. Your safety, what people are seeing, um, but how uh, an impression as a mentor and a leader we are with the folks we support uh, to get off the phone if you're supposed to be focused, right? Um, and then business etiquette again goes back to um, aspects of business. So if you go for an interview, if you meet someone and it's more formal, uh, again you'll see a picture there's someone on the phone and the person's got their just sort of staring at you. So these are the things that we go over. And we create sort of, I think have questions or other concerns, we go through them all. And like this alone, people's self-esteem bursts, their self-respect bursts. And then they start going home and giving their family members or siblings heck. Because they're like, hey, you're being rude. Where did that come from? Right? I get phone calls. I get phone calls saying, so-and-so did the dishes. That's never happened. It's because they feel good and they want to be a part of it. You have to get them to feel good about themselves and be a part of your family, you know? Not, it shouldn't be assumed that they should, they're should not allowed to do it, they should do it, right? So let's practice. We're gonna do the handshake, okay? I want everyone to stand up, introduce yourself to the individuals at your table as if you've just met them. Formally, handshake. How was your handshake? Handshakes are an important introductory ritual in all matters of social context, okay? Did you have a bone crusher? <laughs> Did anyone crush your hand? You know who you are. The yes, What's that? Their confusing handshakes make you feel out of touch. <laughs> they never let go. Blah, 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 blah. Okay? 
the misfire. <laughs> right? Awkward, awkward, awkward. The politician. Those who shake with both hands and trying to sell you something. <laughs> And last but not least, sweaty McSpiderson. It's like you got a second pair of armpits. Okay? So think about your handshake and the impression that you've just made. And, I, and, and it's really important. Again, we practiced handshakes like we do complimenting. We'll practice every single day until they get the handshake down. Because it's your signature, it's your tool, it's your marketing, it's your first impression. So if you just had a bad handshake today, you've stepped up your game after this, I guarantee it. Thank you. So let's talk about what your type is. We're gonna move along a little bit. So when we talk about, remember what makes your heart, what's a crush, okay? So what, <laughs> Betty White, she get your juices flowing or what? Right? Is this your type? Why is she your type? Okay, what quality? Is she a stranger? Yes, she is. So we talk about the celebrity piece, right? I don't even know who this guy is. But. <laughs> Harry? Is his name Harry? Yeah. Uh, wrong direction? Yeah, yeah. I had a girl who was obsessed with Harry. I think that's why I kept it here. So does Harry get your juices flowing? How about George Clooney? Yeah. yeah, see? <laughs> Last but not least, Jennifer Aniston, yeah. So we talk about who's your type. So we talk about the difference between celebrity and a per an actual person, okay? And maybe there's a physical piece. Let's dissect that, but let's look at the kind of person you're really interested in, okay? So, different ways to communicate. So when we talk about that person that you're interested in, we talk about different ways to communicate. On the phone, on the internet, do we text? And this is the Swedish one with the old school phone. Love it. How do we communicate? We talk about and break down and dissect different ways to communicate and how we communicate with people. Uh, we have a lot of folks who are online and um, talking to people online and setting up dates online. So we talk a lot about the safety of dating online. Uh, phone etiquette comes into this and texting. I, I, I don't know how it's appropriate entirely to have a relation, other than the Snapchat stuff. There's a lot of stuff happening. Um, online that I'm constantly having to stay on top of, but have the conversations around what, what, what their values are around communication and how to support them in that. How to prepare for a date. Okay, do we go to McDonald's? Do we go to maybe a nicer restaurant with a tablecloth? Or do we just have pizza? Okay, so we talk about what your budget is, what your comfort level is, um, where would you like to go, those sort of things, um, and what maybe what where the person would like to go on the date as well. But all those factors. So we talk about is it accessible? Okay. There's lots of things you could do research online now, where you can just look up a restaurant, figure out their menu. We we talk about tipping. We have to talk about tipping. Um, we talk about uh, what the cost will be. And I remember this one guy's like, okay, I can go to this restaurant only if she doesn't order a steak and only a salad. <laughs> That's not going to work because you're taking her on a date. You can't limit what her menu items are and how can you have this conversation, right? So we talk about, okay, that's not the right restaurant. Okay? But these are the kind of things that you need to talk about. So what to do during a date? Do we go dancing? This is the Swedish stuff, by the way, you can tell. The Metallica t-shirt. The Scandinavians love hard metal, I just have to tell you. I mean, that crowd too. So you'll see the Metallica on a ship. Uh, do you hold hands? Do you uh, put your arms around each other? So we talk about hand holding, and hand holding's you know it's it's a pretty intimate thing, right? When you hold someone's hand, Jen, <coughs> if you hold someone's hand, you're this is pretty. This is kind of what you do with your mom or your sibling, right? But are you going to do? Sorry, I didn't ask for consent first. But if I did this with Jen, do you think this has changed? Oh, yeah. yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Sorry. So we talk about the appropriateness of hand holding and when it's appropriate if you ask, right? Uh, especially putting your arms, the, the walking like this is so awkward. Like, this is just for photo op, come on. People do not walk like this. Um, but you can talk about how uncomfortable that is and that, you know, there's all aspects of issues there, but height and maybe your armpit smell, I don't know. But you talk about all this stuff, right? Dancing, how you dance with someone, when it's appropriate. 
sometimes they don't have the social cue or the ability to pick up on the energies of that stuff, okay? So how do we support a healthy relationship? So now we've gone to dinner, dancing, and now maybe we're getting to what base? It's probably third base. Um, we talk about, <laughs> some of this could be first. Um, I don't judge. Um, we talk about this aspect of a relationship and we talk about what does this picture mean to you, right? Um, and what's happening in this picture and we discuss it. Because this concept can be completely out of, their, out of the folks' heads, okay? And you have to understand that. You can't assume people think this could be for someone, this is sex, right here, I'm done. Or I'm, I was done at the date. Okay, that's okay. But take them on the journey. So we talk a lot about this. Or you call them Jen. <laughs> and you say, I need help from here on. <laughs> okay? So, time for the facts of life. Oh, do you remember this show? <laughs> this is a great show. There's a lot of diversity. Okay? And guess who was on the show? George Clooney. Do you remember him? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Sometimes when I do this with the, with the, the folks, they don't know what I'm talking about because I'm obviously too old. Um, so anyways, let's talk about the facts of life. Let's have some fun. Okay. How do you support a healthy, set that active sexual relationship? Here we go. We're getting on that. Okay? The word, S-E-X. S-E-X, um, I find that if I put sex in my title of my workshop, people hit the panic button. You know, it's, it's incredible. The word just makes people feel sometimes so uncomfortable. So sometimes I just call it something else and then have a whole workshop about sex. <laughs> um, and this is again where you can call in Jen if you're not comfortable with having a conversation about sex. So what do we talk about during this? What, what do we talk about? I don't necessarily talk about <coughs> sexual, uh, we talk about sexual intercourse and we're going to be doing an activity as well as a final activity. But I talk about, you know, the, the consent piece, um, what sex is, how, what pregnancy and how pregnancy is. It's amazing when you talk about uh, where babies come from and the whole conversation about reproduction. Um, I had one individual, just, she was uh, just amazing, but she just looked at me and she said, I had no idea that's how you got pregnant. I had no idea. The sad thing about that is she had a five-year-old son. Oh. And she just learned it in my workshop how she got pregnant. Oh, wow. This is the kind of conversations I'm having with people they don't understand. Right? This person got pregnant in the stairwell of a school. So when you talk about accessing a safe space and having a conversation, yeah. You need to, you need to have the conversation. Because they don't understand the consequence a penis in the vagina in pregnancy. Not necessarily always that way. But just, you have to talk about it. And if you're not comfortable talking about it, bring someone in that is and keep having the conversation constantly. Questions? Okay, we're gonna have some more fun. So this, by the way, Sex and the City, fantastic show. I learned a lot from this show. Um, but TV is a huge influence on the people we support. So I find a lot of the references about shows, and if we talk about relationships, they, they, they see relationships like a Hollywood movie. You know the sex scenes where they start kissing and making out, and then the next scene is they're just laying in bed and they look really relaxed? But there's that piece in the middle that they don't see, right? So that's where our job is for any one of us who are curious. We need to figure this out. They'll never show, I'm sure, I mean they have, I'm sure, a proper sex scene of awkwardness, discomfort, not working out so well. Maybe the 40-year-old virgin, it's been a long time since I've seen that. But there's not a lot of movies where you see that discomfort or that, that uh, not, in, in those moments where it's like, you're about to have a sex scene, just so you got to put a condom on. Yeah, that's not hot in television, right? So that's the part that a lot of the folks are missing. So we talk about movies and things that have influenced them so I can get a nice idea of how to fill in the gaps. Okay, so let's have some more fun. How to use a condom. This is a really empowering thing for the folks who support. <laughs> Even just touching it. In your envelopes, folks, is a banana and some condoms. But not just a banana, because I believe in diversity. Two of you have something else in your envelopes. <laughs> Five years. Oh, I haven't touched one of these in 25 or 35 years. Today is your day. <laughs>